Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Razia Khan, Standard Chartered Bank Chief Economist and Head of Research for Africa and the Middle East. Enjoy this quality conversation. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor Razikan, Standard Chartered Bank Chief Economist for Africa and the Middle East. Great uh, uh, excitement to have you on the show today. Thank you very much. Razia, you were, 2015, you were named as uh, Africa's, one of uh, Africa's 100 most influential people, uh, which is why we're coming to you. We celebrate you as, uh, as, a, as a fellow Af African. And as a result of um, the, uh, the, the expertise that you have, you found yourself uh, advising uh, the, the Treasury in the US, uh, the New York uh, Federal Bank, Reserve Bank, and the African Development Bank. I mean, that's, uh, that's a huge responsibility on your part, uh, Razia. Well, lots of different institutions who have an interest in African economies. And, and, and tell me, what's, what is it like? Um, you were born in uh, Botswana. Uh, talk to me about, about that. Where were you born in Botswana? So my mother's family had lived in South Africa. My father's family had been in Botswana for a long time. And so I was raised in Botswana before I came to the UK for university. Fully Southern African in that sense. And where did you go to school, Razia? Most of my education up to A-levels was in Botswana itself. Marwapula may be fairly well known to a Southern African audience. After coming to the UK, I did both my undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at the London School of Economics. What were those uh, uh, post undergraduate and postgraduate degrees? Could I be really boring and say yes, absolutely. A MSc in economics with a focus on development studies? And then after that, you went back to, to Botswana. That's right. Having started my career with Standard Chartered initially in our Botswana operations, and of course, Trevor, you would be very familiar with the history of the bank in the region, mm. having been one of the main high street banks, a very well-known name across Southern Africa. Mm. And, and so as you sit there, um, Razia, uh, the, the first thing is... Uh, you know, we just had, had the South African uh, budget, and I know you follow these things very closely. Uh, what were your biggest takeaways from the South African budget? So everyone was expecting, before the budget was even announced, that maybe the news was not going to be as bad as had initially been feared. Last year, amid the COVID crisis, when we saw that significant decline in second quarter growth, with South Africa going into a very severe lockdown, by global standards even, the fear was that it would take a long, long time for revenue to recover. And what we already knew by the time the budget was going to be read was actually some sectors of the economy hadn't done all that badly. This doesn't mean that the revenue performance was dramatic or upbeat. There are lots of people talking about a tax windfall, and we think that is wrong. Mm. That is losing a sense of the big picture. Nonetheless, we know that China saw a pretty robust recovery. Towards the end of the year, China's economy was growing, some would say, even faster than its potential, perhaps. We saw this reflected in the performance of the mining sectors of different economies, and South Africa was no exception. Mm. It seems as though there had been some revenue overrun based on corporate income taxes, based on the fact that mining companies were doing a little bit better than had initially been expected. Mm. And um, the, the, we, we saw a bit of uh, emphasis on uh, infrastructure and investment. Am I, am I right? Do you take any, any positives, out, positives out of that? <laughs> 
Well, this is the big challenge for South Africa going forward. And to put it in perspective, yes, we saw this revenue surprise, but markets had almost fully anticipated okay. that. The really big takeaway from the budget was that the borrowing requirement was going to fall probably a lot more than many market participants, many analysts like myself, had actually thought likely. That was the big announcement. Of course, that doesn't mean anything in the real world has changed. It just means that South Africa is thinking very seriously about how it funds its budget going forward mm. because of this realization that under the old plans, if it kept borrowing to finance the deficit, then it would be running up higher levels of public debt. Public debt to GDP would be peaking at really, really high levels. And the concern then would be around affordability. How much do you spend on debt service and does it leave any room for any other kind of spending? So you're absolutely right, Trevor. The real story of the budget has been let's try to improve the composition of spending. Mm. Instead of the old story, consistent growth disappointment, investment being really weak, mm. is there a way to realign South Africa's budget to cut down on some of the consumption that has been taken as the norm in the recent past and to say, we're just going to be very strict and we're not going to spend so much of the resources on public sector wages, as unpopular as that might be. Instead, we're going to try to create the room for investment because the real challenge facing the South African economy isn't the nature of the bounce back in the very near term. As we see the transition from level three to level one, yes, there's an expectation that more sectors of the economy will open up and one hopes this isn't very premature. But the real question mark facing South Africa is how do you get growth going to a, at a decent enough pace in the future? There is only one way, and that is to be investing more. Moving, moving away from South Africa, we've just seen Kenya do a deal with the IMF for a staff monitored uh, program. Is that good news? So Kenya has been talking for some time about its willingness to go to the IMF for funding. There is a realization that even after that initial wave of COVID, it's going to be a very difficult time. And if we think back to what had happened around March, April last year, it's very difficult to think of a similar shock that the Kenyan economy had been through. Mm -hmm. Initially, horticulture exports were down, passenger travel was curbed, tourism, that wasn't happening at all. Kenya relies on some of those passenger flights to make its freight cheaper, to sell its cut flowers, to sell the vegetables to the European market. So all of a sudden remittances were down, horticulture were da was down, tourism was down. Kenya had been hit in multiple ways through multiple external shocks. The good news of course, is that we've seen some recovery since then. Horticulture has actually been performing quite strongly, but it's going to be a while for tourism to rebound. And in the background to all of this, there have been concerns around how Kenya navigates its way in terms of having built up a fair amount of external debt. Are there any other reassurances that need to be in place so that it can tell everyone, yes, we've got the growth, we'll be able to repay the debt. Fundamentally, Kenya going to the IMF is saying, is there a way to safeguard our story? By doing what the IMF will suggest in terms of fiscal reforms, we will be sending a very strong signal to investors, to other creditors, that we're going to do the right thing with fiscal policy. We're not going to see our debt going to even greater levels because we'll be consolidating the fiscal. And so in that sense, what we've seen from the IMF is a staff level agreement. It means the initial stage in this process of being able to secure IMF funding, we can tick that off. Of course, the real test for Kenya still comes ahead. We know that this is going to be a pretty lively time for Kenyan politics. There's likely to be a constitutional referendum. This seems increasingly probable around the middle of this year. This is even before we get to the election next year. And the big question mark still is, 
Yes, there's been a need for Kenya to look at its fiscal situation for some time to reassure that it's bringing down these deficits. How possible is this going to be with a constitutional referendum potentially happening at the same time? So good news with the IMF staff level agreement, but a lot of uncertainty still. Wow. In, in terms of uh, looking at the broad continental picture, uh, Razia, what risks do you see for the continent in the first instance? And what opportunities, given where we are at the present moment, talking briefly, I mean, uh, uh, in broad terms? Sure. So the big issue across the world, not just Africa, as we all know, was COVID mm. last year. Right now, we're in a situation where here in the UK, very dramatic progress is being made in terms of the speed with which vaccines are being rolled out. And there's a sense of confidence that even though we remain in a lockdown, it feels as though it's gone on for some time. Nonetheless, if the pledge is that every adult in the UK can be vaccinated by the end of July, that is a marker in the calendar. That suggests that a reopening will be likely. Similarly, the US has been making rapid progress on that front. But the big uncertainty for many African economies is twofold. So the first, as we know, there's been all of the discussion around Africa's ability to procure vaccines. And yes, we've started to see the rollout under the COVAX scheme. We've seen the arrival of some vaccines even outside of that in South Africa. But if we look at the global numbers, as of yesterday, something like 0.04% of the vaccines had been administered in sub-Saharan Africa. We know there are affordability issues. For countries that are looking to do this perhaps outside of the COVAX scheme, they are having to pay a significant premium to source the vaccines. Through the COVAX scheme, it seems to be happening very slowly. And there's an impatience to say, can we not get this to go any faster? The real risk that we see front and center of the economic risks Africa is still facing is if it's going to take a long time to get the rollout of the vaccines, we know that the COVID containment measures, the hard lockdowns, the curfews come at an economic cost. You can't keep that going indefinitely. But we're not looking at a situation where the vaccine supply is going to be available, let alone affordable, for rapid rollout in the near term. And so the risk is that we'll have to find a way to live with COVID, to guard against the potential emergence of successive new waves of COVID, and it's a risk for the global economy as well. It makes little sense for developed economies to say, well, you know, we've been very successful with the vaccine rollout, if there is a substantial part of the globe where there hasn't been meaningful immunization, this really raises the risk that we could be seeing new variants and then maybe the effectiveness of the current vaccines may be called into question. We don't know which way those new variants are going to go. So it would be in everyone's interest to come up with a better solution, more multilateralism, more of a concerted global effort to ensure that everyone has access to the vaccines. Mm. And I did see a report, uh, um, Razia, on that from uh, the UNCTAD, actually saying that there is a potential that um, uh, if uh, vaccines are not made available to the developing uh, world, the developed countries are going to be impacted negatively because of uh, uh, trade relations and uh, uh, the, the trade connectivity and so forth. Do you have concerns around that? So there are different ways of looking at this. And one somewhat pragmatic view is, okay, we recognize it takes a while to get the vaccines rolled out everywhere. At least if you have a certain level of reopening in developed markets, that's where a lot of the economic activity is centered. So that will boost global demand and it's ultimately better for everyone's economic prospects. And yes, there is truth to that up to a point, but the real issue here is what Africa offers to the rest of the world. We know that Africa has a younger demographic. We know that it's got a faster population growth rate. If we're looking 
at where we would expect the center of global consumption to be coming from in the future, increasingly it's in those younger developing markets with the right demographic. That is where we are going to be seeing a lot more consumption in the future. So if we're looking at a crisis in the present day, and if we're a little bit too comfortable about the fact that we're seeing a reversal of development gains, that we are seeing a real rise in poverty levels, that there are children who are unable to be educated the way they would have been pre-COVID because schools have been shut for such a long time. And if no one is doing anything about that, it is a huge lost opportunity for the global economy because the strength of consumption we could be seeing in the future, the strength of economic growth in, very much, in what is very much an interconnected world. What we're saying is we're just letting that go right now with the inadequacy of the global policy response. So this is something that does need to be looked at very carefully. Of course, it's good news that there can be a rapid rollout of the vaccine in any one center. But the reality is we live in an interdependent world. One, there is the health effect. If you haven't seen sufficient rollout of the vaccines everywhere, and two, it's a suboptimal economic outcome. Are there lessons here for the continent, uh, Razia? I'm thinking in terms of, if you look at uh, how, uh, to some extent, the South African uh, uh, economy was able to deal with uh, the manufacturing of PPE, and to some extent, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there were some uh, uh, exper experiments, rather, that took place down there. Are there lessons around Africa investing in the manufacturing sector in the first instance. Secondly, lessons around strengthening Africa's health delivery system. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely on, on both fronts. So what we've seen in the recent past, if we were to go back in time a bit, and we know that there had been a checkered history of economic growth through the 1970s and 1980s. Things started to improve periodically in the 1990s for the region as a whole. But it wasn't until 2001 thereabouts where we started to see a sustained rise in prospects for most of Africa. And the good news was possibly that in most places, not all, so there were exceptions, of course, important exceptions, but in most of the major economies, we started to see the building blocks for perhaps greater prosperity in the future. The number one requirement is that you're able to sustain growth at a fairly high level for some period of time. And that means investment needs to stay high. So confidence needs to be there to be able to deliver that. But the problem with a lot of the growth that we did see was that it wasn't necessarily sufficiently broad based. And in a lot of instances, it was all about consumption. Mm. So that age old issue of how do we boost manufacturing se sectors? Africa will have the pop future population. It will have the scale. But will the manufacturing be entirely offshored? Do other locations get such a big competitive advantage that that value addition never comes to Africa, that we never see the benefit of that industrialization? Now, that seems like a very alarming way of looking at it, but what the recent crisis has shown us in a very clear way is that the ability to preserve what manufacturing capacity there is the ability to build on that future manufacturing capacity, the ability to source all of the inputs that might be needed, including a reliable and reasonably affordable power supply, this is going to be important. We could do a whole hour just on the issues facing <laughs> Africa manufacturing. But to answer your question on the healthcare provision issue as well, this is important. At the start of the crisis, there was this realization that given the relatively poor provision of public health care in many African countries, we were facing a really big threat. Now, there were some positives as well. The region's recent experience with Ebola, the experience with being able to put new protocols in place very rapidly, populations that were generally compliant with the kind of containment measures that were needed. These were probably strengths. But it's also the case that we can still be doing a lot more to boost healthcare provision across the continent. Mm. 
This is a key requirement for development. We should never fall into the trap of measuring development just in terms of, well, what is GDP doing? You know, is it a technical bounce? Year on year, does this number look better than it did last year? Development is about actual gains. It's about the education that's happening, the quality of that education, the quality of healthcare provision. And we should never ever lose sight of that, that it is the quality of what is changing that matters every bit as much as the growth that we might see. And, 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 and in addition to, to that very important point there, Razia, the ability to train and retain talent. Um, I mean, uh, look at you in London out there, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at scientists that are working for Pfizer, for AstraZeneca and that kind of stuff. We've got our scientists, but they are not on the continent. So hopefully as an expat here in London, I'm picking up useful skills that I'll one day be able to take home. <laughs> I would still say there's a bit of a role to be played in that respect. But yes, you hit on a very real issue, Trevor. And this is, are we creating the opportunities back in individual economies for the best of the talent that the economies are already generating to be able to attract that back? And it's really been a question of the opportunity. We know everything about Africa's economic potential. The question is, when are we really going to get that center of gravity of economic activity moving back in such a decisive way? There have been bouts of optimism. If you think back to the period just before the global financial crisis, you looked at an economy like Nigeria, lots of so-called repats, Nigerians in the diaspora who were going back home because suddenly the better opportunities were there. When economic growth does pick up, when business conditions do improve, you will see a great deal more of that. So I think it's fairly fluid, but it's clear if we take a look at the last decade, the last decade and a half, there has been too much of a, a stop-go record of economic growth, of opportunity, of improving business prospects. What we need to see is much greater consistency. So more and more skilled Africans are feeling comfortable about that decision, saying this is the region where I can really see the growth being sustained for a long enough period of time. And I also have a fair amount of confidence that economies are going to be managed in a way where I won't have to worry about my savings being inflated away or being depleted by foreign exchange depreciation. What everyone is looking for is that much more stability and it needs to be happening region wide. So the interesting question post COVID is how do we build back? We know that there are a few things that are moving in favor of greater regionalization. Finally, finally, yeah. the African free trade agreement. The reality is different signatory countries have five years to dismantle 90% of tariff barriers. We know that there are a lot of other factors that impede greater regionalization. The fact that we've got an infrastructure endowment that is much more about taking what is produced and selling it to the rest of the world. The fact that the bigger markets don't necessarily exist in the hinterland. But over time, with the right policies, with the right approach, this can start to change. And that can be a lifting of economic prospects for everyone. So it sounds like you've got concerns around the implementation of the Africa free trade area, which is supposed to uh, have the potential, if properly implemented, to boost African economies. Talk to me about uh, the, the trade, uh, so, trade area agreement. More than just the implementation, I think there needs to be a pretty realistic look at what the real barriers are mm. to really raising intra-regional trade. And these go back decades, if not even longer. First of all, trade complementarities. Does one country produce what another country needs to get for itself? Is Zimbabwe still producing everything that Botswana needs to buy? 
or is it going to be cheaper for Botswana to try to purchase that from elsewhere? And we know that quite a lot has changed over different decades. Maybe that was a bad example to use, because if we were to go back to the 1980s or 1990s, that was quite a lot that Zimbabwe was producing that it could sell to Botswana, maybe not so much anymore. But the issue of trade complementarities as it applies continent-wide is a very real one. If many of the countries are locked into co being commodity producers, are they really able to produce what their immediate neighbors need? The other part of it, and a real barrier to becoming more significant in scale, to becoming a more significant market, is that the enabling infrastructure just isn't there. If you were to look at a map of all of Africa and look at the major road and rail infrastructure and the ports, you'd see that, that, that it's all about taking what is produced and selling it to the rest of the world. Now, economically, that might make sense because those are the bigger markets. But the question is, how do you get a gradual enough shift in that over time? So the opportunities in terms of trading with each other are also there. The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is a very important step in the right direction, but we also need to be very clear-headed about this. Nothing changes from day one. It is a long-term process. There needs to be political commitment, there needs to be a willingness to really dismantle those barriers, tariff or non-tariff barriers. There needs to be a willingness to say, for the greater good, we are willing to open up. What happened with the onset of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, even in the bigger economies? I can recall talking to corporates in Nigeria. The discussion then was fuel prices are going up, fuel subsidies were supposed to have been lifted, power sector tariffs are starting to go up because there has to be cost recovery for power. And even in Africa's most populous economy, businesses were asking, are we really competitive enough given that we will have to face all of these costs, given that we have to encounter all of this, to say nothing about the availability of foreign exchange? We know that in order for African economies to grow, there has to be greater intra-regionalization. We've got to exploit economies of scale. Africa needs to make itself more attractive to investment from other African countries, as well as wider afield. We know that this demands a different focus, a greater regionalization. But as you've said, Trevor, implementation of the Continental Free Trade Agreement is one part of it. And even with the best will in the world, Let's acknowledge that this is going to be a slow, gradual process. Wow, that's very realistic right there. Uh, let's move on to uh, another problematic area. Is the continent uh, facing another debt crisis? Are we uh, at the doorstep of another debt, debt crisis? What's your view? So this is the big, big concern. What happened in 2020? Even before that, we know that it had been cheap for many different sovereigns to borrow in international capital markets, and that's completely fine. So long as they are doing everything that is required in the way of reform, keeping confidence up, when you issue a euro bond, ideally you want to be able to refinance that very easily. When it comes to repaying the euro bond, given that you've still got financing needs, are you able to raise enough to repay it, possibly more cheaply, and still borrow anything new that you might need to fund infrastructure? So even prior to the COVID crisis, there had been a concern that growth in the region was slowing, that there had been significant external borrowing, but it wasn't the case in all instances that just because different sovereigns could borrow externally, they could borrow get an inflow of foreign exchange, that they were necessarily seeing the big boost to their own growth potential. In many instances, the commodity price volatility we saw was overriding. So pre-COVID, there's already concern that some countries have debt ratios that are too elevated, and they're starting to spend too much of their budgetary allocations just on servicing that debt. Along comes the COVID crisis and we see revenue plummet across the board in a way that very few finance ministers would have anticipated. 
there is a real life crisis. And yes, there is a multilateral response. The IMF comes through with emergency financing for many countries. They, of course, have to be good, not in arrears to the IMF to be able to uh, borrow even more from the fund. But the problem is that is still lending. That is still a loan that will need to be repaid in three years. The G20 proposes a debt service um, suspension initiative, and that provides very important what we would call liquidity relief for borrowing countries. If they owe debt to multilateral or official creditors, they can say, maybe, you know, give us a break from having to service this debt up until the end of June 2021. Then there'll be a one year grace period. And then we'll start, we'll resume the servicing of that debt and we'll have five years beyond that over which to repay what we would have had to repay over the time of the DSSI. That is important liquidity relief, but the problem is it does nothing about the debt load of those countries. Mm -hmm. Now it's already been recognized. The G20 has already proposed a common framework. The realization that for some countries they've taken on so much debt that even with this debt service suspension in place, it's not going to change anything. They might as well wake up to the fact that they need to take more significant action to reduce their debt load. And we're starting to see that happening. So Chad, Ethiopia, Zambia, these are countries that have requested common framework treatment of their debt. And the hope is that all creditors, everyone who has lent to these countries, external lending is what we're talking about. It's about the foreign currency borrowing of those countries, that all creditors can sit down together and everyone can come up with a solution that works for all in terms of how to make the debt more sustainable. But for countries that don't go down that route, there is still an issue. And that is many different sub-Saharan African economies were struggling to raise the revenue that they needed to do. If you look at somewhere like Nigeria, it's revenue mobilization ratio, the amount of taxes plus the oil, um, related revenue that it collects as a percentage of GDP is in single digits. That's not nearly adequate for the needs of the Nigerian economy. So in many instances, there is this thinking that actually the debt load is too high. And there are different ways that you can work out of that. The most favorable way for all concerned would be if you're still seeing GDP increasing at a very rapid pace, then over time, the debt as a percentage of GDP starts to be less meaningful. But for many African countries, it isn't even that. It's that they collect so little in revenue that what they have to pay in debt service in any one year, when you look at that as a proportion of what revenue they're able to collect, those ratios are very, very high, uncomfortably high. It does have a feedback into what happens with the real economy. So for an investor thinking, you know, should I be investing in this economy? Do they have a relatively low debt to GDP ratio? Does it even matter to me? There's always the risk that something is going to have to change in a big way, that taxes will have to be raised, that spending from government might have to slow very significantly as a way of trying to make this debt more affordable in the future, to bring down debt levels. And that's the overhang. That is the confidence issue that we're going to have to face up to in many different African economies. And it didn't have to be this way. Some of us have been looking at this since the HIPIC multilateral yeah, yeah, initiative. Yeah. The, the belief was, well, we've wiped the slate clean. This is a fresh start, you know, build back that better, but do it with a full focus on revenue and not building up excessive levels of debt. And unfortunately, as we've seen, especially for very commodity dependent economies, where so much depends on whether commodity prices are behaving or not behaving, it's been more difficult. Mm. I was just going to say that, uh, Razia, that uh, we've been here before. <laughs> and uh, clearly the lessons have not been learned. And I, I, I see the, uh, the remedies that you are, you are, you are proffering. 
uh, uh, you know, stuff that has been said before, there doesn't seem to be the political will, uh, you know, efficient tax uh, uh, collection and uh, efficient management of the economies. Do you have any confidence of us getting out of this place in a place in a sustainable manner? Well, necessity leads to quite a lot of innovation, right? So yeah. who would want to second guess what happens? But I think there's also the risk that we do overdo the concern. I think for many economies that have borrowed in external markets, they do have a plan for how they raise revenue over the medium to long term. They do have a plan for how to make the debt sustainable and they do have a plan for how to manage it. But what is crucial, what is very necessary is that the growth does come back to the region. And this brings us front and center to the outlook in 2021. Mm -hmm. We kind of know that there's got to be a technical bounce. We're not seeing lockdowns like we were seeing last year, even though a second wave of COVID might be a threat. Most of the governments in the region have said, you know, you pay too high an economic price with the hard lockdown. So we've just got to try to manage this better without shutting down so much of the economy. The good news, of course, is that commodity prices have, to some extent, bounced back because of China's rapid growth, because of the bounce back that we've seen in global trade. There is, for now, greater support to certain commodity markets. Oil prices have certainly turned around in a reasonably significant way. How long lasting that is, we'll have to see. But it is important to never lose sight of the fact that we need to manage things perhaps that much more conservatively, even when the growth does return. Mm -hmm. There should never be a temptation to overborrow just because it's possible to borrow quite cheaply. Do you think that uh, you've already spoken about building better, back better? Do you think that there is the realization of the opportunity that? Uh, uh, a post-COVID scenario presents around building back better, point number one. Point number two, does the climate crisis, is there recognition on the continent that the climate crisis uh, uh, does present that opportunity to build back better? Let's go to basics and take advantage of the opportunities that the two crises are offering the continent. What's your view on that? So this is an area where we think in many different markets in Africa, there's going to have to be much more thinking about how that adaptation happens. On the first one, build back better, we know that Africa already offers certain strengths. Across the world, there's a certain amount of, well, there are just lots of unknowns. You get over the technical bounce in growth, you get the reopening of the economy, you get a rush as people have been saving a lot in lockdowns that they will go out and start buying things and maybe growth looks good up to a certain point. But in developed markets, the real question is, how does it look after that? Have we seen so many businesses going under as part of this crisis that really the years ahead are going to be much more difficult. Mm. The building back better element for African economies rests, of course, with the demographics of the region. Emerging markets, by definition, are frontier markets, as some would say, are economies where very rapid change is the norm. And you're seeing people who are looking for opportunities and are going to be making those opportunities happen. There's a certain momentum to economic activity where it would be very unusual if you didn't see that comeback in a meaningful way. Now, the building back better is thinking, well, how does the experience of the COVID crisis transform how we do things? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be more demand for digital? Absolutely. Have African economies already shown an ability to leapfrog existing technology? Are they rapid adopters of new ways of doing things? Yes, and that will be a part of building back better. Then there is the whole issue of whether we can build back greener mm -hmm. and build back more sustainably. Mm -hmm. And part of the overhang is that for some parts of Africa, not all, but this is especially true of Southern Africa, there has been such a significant carbon reliance. If you think of using, pole, uh, using coal to power electricity to provide what might be needed, electricity as you make the switch to renewables, initially it seems pretty daunting, it's quite expensive, 
But we also know that the opportunity once again lies in Africa's starting point. If this is a region that is willing to adapt, that can adapt very rapidly, can, that can adopt new ways of doing things, and with the view in mind that the way to attract investment, there is so much more investment flow going into greener projects, going into renewables, this has to be the solution for Africa's power deficit. So if I were to say, using pretty broad brush strokes, mm. yes, there is this sense globally that we've got to do things differently. And Africa's real strength lies in its ability to adapt, lies in its ability to transform. This is a region where rapid change is still absolutely possible at a fairly low cost to begin with. And that is an important strength as the whole global economy looks to build back differently post COVID. The other thing that COVID has taught us is that perhaps it's less important where you're physically located. If you can get a decent internet connection, there is a lot of work that you can do from far flung locations. That should be great news in terms of what we do with employment opportunities in the region. If you think of English speaking Africa and the ability to tap into that demand globally, there should be significant opportunities ahead. But we're only, only at the very cusp of being able to realize those opportunities. Mm. You've already spoken about technology and adaptation. I've just been looking at Nigeria and seeing uh, tremendous excitement around uh, blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies. Is the continent ready? Are our regulators ready? What should, what should Africa be doing as far as Bitcoin and, uh, and other cryptocurrencies are concerned? Well, this is where regulators are going to have to get a lot more comfortable with the pace of change and changes in areas that perhaps they don't anticipate right at the very outset. One of the lessons of the recent crisis is that we have seen perhaps a more constrained environment when it came to the functioning of markets, even where things should have been working smoothly. This wasn't always the case. In some instances, we've seen greater restrictions than were, that were in place pre-COVID. And the whole demand for crypto, if you like, the development of different ways of doing things may well be part of the natural urge to try to overcome some of those constraints that are in place. So a starting point for regulators in the region might be, how do we deregulate ourselves? How do we create an overall climate that is so conducive to getting things done that we, we don't see the pace of change carrying us away, that we see the development or greater demand for cryptocurrencies, when we're wondering why is it that we don't see the demand for the currencies that already exist, the, the currencies that are issued by individual central banks. So I think there are two sides to this. One is inevitable global momentum, the development of new ways of doing things, but the other is that specific appeal in an African context. Where have the regulations really inhibited development of markets as they should have happened? More naturally, the smooth functioning of markets, that's where you're going to see this search for other solutions. That's where the demand is coming from. And maybe that's what regulators do need to address. Mm -hmm. Sitting there as somebody who's got access to the regulators, having given advice to central bank governors all across the continent, what advice would you give them? So long-termism matters. And a very interesting thing that we saw in the recent past was we were faced with a crisis in countries where there had been accumulated credibility over many years, policymakers could do even more. They could cut interest rates even faster. They could offer regulatory relief because they had already built up this credibility, this belief in the strength of the regulated financial systems. It just allowed them the leeway to do a lot more in response to the crisis. So if there's one key learning point from the experience of the crisis is that Every bit that you do to add to policy credibility in a normal year, in a non-crisis year, it has its place too. 
often the policy debate in Africa is, are we being too conservative? Should we be adopting inflation targeting just because countries elsewhere have decided that this is a good thing? It is absolutely a good thing to safeguard the livelihoods of different people in Africa. It is absolutely a good thing to safeguard the livelihoods of the poor. And what we do know, because it's been demonstrated through the recent crisis, is that a robust platform, when it's clear what regulators stand for, when it is clear that central banks are putting this price stability at the very center of everything that they do, that that pays a significant dividend in a crisis when systems are being tested, when the usual policy tightness can be relaxed, when there's a big case for re relaxing it. So I think it's going to be a testing time still Everyone started 2021 thinking, wow, we've seen this massive expansion of global central bank balance sheets and all that money is going to be flowing back into emerging markets and frontier markets. And what we know about the experience of markets in the recent past is that it's never a straight line. What we've seen instead is a lot of debate around the scale of the US fiscal stimulus. Is this going to be leading to inflation at some point down the line? That hasn't been the big driver of what we've seen in markets necessarily, but it's been a part of it. And what we do know is we're seeing a lot more volatility in US markets than had been assumed. We know that it's not necessarily going to be a straight line case of everyone's looking for yield. So get back into emerging markets, get back into frontier markets. And we know that policymakers are going to be tested. Those who can show a strong willingness to reform will likely be rewarded for it. What we do know, however, is that we're not going to see blanket flows into every single economy just because of this abundance of global liquidity. Mm. But we haven't seen uh, a significant uh, amount of uh, stimuli coming from uh, African uh, central banks. Is it because of uh, uh, that the, there isn't the capacity to do that? What's your, what's your reading of uh, the look of that? Because oh. one would have thought that the economies, uh, you know, the private sector does need a bit of support. I mean, we've seen a bit coming from the South African government. What's your reading of uh, the, the continental trend? I would argue that to the extent that the space was available, yes, we've seen significant monetary easing, much more so than fiscal easing, in the region, there was very, very constrained space for any meaningful fiscal stimulus from different authorities. But the question that keeps coming up is, why aren't we seeing QE in Africa? Mm. Why are we not seeing central banks flooding their economies with liquidity? We have examples, real life examples of what happens when we see that kind of money supply growth. Think of Zimbabwe's experience. Is that really the kind of situation that people want? Is it that they want to see so much of a flooding of the system with liquidity that inflation becomes a real risk? I don't think anyone would willingly opt for that kind of policy choice. The reality is that unless countries have established a reputation for very low inflation, unless they have the kind of demographic profile that suggests that the big struggle for central banks is trying to get some inflation rather than trying to contain inflation, then those kind of policies, the quantitative easing, the rapid expansion of balance sheets, they're simply not appropriate for the region's economies. Now, having said that, we have seen instances in Ghana, a wider fiscal deficit, the Bank of Ghana announced in a transparent way, the government can't finance it itself, and we're going to step in and we're going to buy government bonds in the primary market, but up to a certain limit. And so long as that limit isn't exceeded, everyone understands that inflation in a crisis is less of a threat. Elsewhere, we've seen the Central Bank of Nigeria financing government to a much greater extent. And the concern there is, at what point do you, do you reverse that? Discussions are underway, how to take what has been done already, how to securitize that. It will ultimately be added to government debt stock. 
the reality of the situation is there are no easy answers for African economies. And that is because this is a region where inflation is still much, much more of a threat than deflation. Quantitative easing type policies only make sense in certain policy settings. And it would be wrong to misrepresent that and to think that this is something that can be rolled out across sub-Saharan Africa. The reality is that can't happen without there being serious, serious negative economic consequences. We, we, we saw um, the uh, Nigerian uh, authorities uh, 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 announcing the rebasing of their GDP. We did see uh, a similar uh, process in Zimbabwe. What's your view? Is, is it a good thing to do? And what are the right circumstances to be, to be rebasing uh, GDP? <laughs> The boring economist answer is that a rebasing is something that should happen very regularly. Really, it should be something of a statistical exercise. Do we get better at measuring the economy and economic activity over time? Are we able to come up with measures that are the most accurate that we can given the constraints? And a rebasing of an economy would just look at how GDP has changed, how the sectoral composition of GDP has changed. And it's part of a continuous process to try to get better data at the end of it. Now, where it's received a lot of attention in the sub-Saharan African context, if we think back to Nigeria's first rebasing a few years ago, when it announced that the economy was 89% greater than had been previously thought, and everyone thought, wow, but the reality is that Nigeria had struggled to raise more revenue outside of oil before that rebasing, and it struggled to raise more revenue after the rebasing. GDP, the measure of GDP, isn't something that changes very much in the real world. It might give you a sense of comfort if you have a very big GDP, then maybe when you look at debt measured as a percentage of GDP, it doesn't look that great. But what we should be focusing a lot more is how much revenue is being collected from that estimate of GDP. And what we've seen, the trend with rebasings in the Africa region in the recent past is, we know there's a great deal of economic informality. We know that there's a lot of economic activity that somehow is very difficult to measure or never gets measured. So anything that improves on this with each successive rebasing, when we get a more accurate picture of what is actually going on is a good thing, but it doesn't stop there. The effort should be, how do you formalize what is in the informal economy? How do you really make it count? GDP rebasings will continue to get a lot of interest, outsized interest perhaps, because of what they say about the scale of economic activity actually taking place. We shouldn't forget the question we should ask with every single rebasing. So what does that tell us about revenue as a percentage of GDP? Are governments doing enough? Are they really creating the capacity to be more effective in terms of fiscal policy going forward. If you just see an expansion in GDP and you don't see any expansion in revenue collection that follows it, that suggests that something's wrong. Wow. Awesome stuff. On the show, uh, Razia, we love books. And I know you love books too. And I follow your book recommendations quite closely. Would you do us a favor and recommend uh, three books that you have read recently that have made a re a a an impact on you for our book loving viewers all over the world? Three whole books. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the one that springs to mind immediately is Atomic Habits, which mm. I read reasonably recently. And why I liked this was it just created a sense of confidence. The idea behind it is that if you read, if you adopt certain habits, you almost do good things on autopilot. If you wake up and you think, the first thing I'm going to do is exercise before I get to work, and you do that consistently every single day, you're going to be in a better space than the kind of person who wakes up and says, ah, let me scramble to get that work done, and the exercise is forgotten. So I really liked that book, first of all, because of the bite-sized nature of what it was suggesting, 
where it's very readable, short chapters, but good advice. And most of all, it gives you the confidence that you can make changes. Who is the author? Who is the author, Razia? James Cleary, I think. I'll have okay. to double check the name, but That's it's fine. called Atomic Habits. It's pretty well known. Fantastic. The other, and I am in danger of recommending this excessively, is the book Why We Sleep. Oh. Now, <laughs> that one, for many of us who perhaps shortchange ourselves by thinking, oh, I'll get so much more done if I just skimp a little bit on the sleep. I'll, you know, keep working on this paper. I'll, I'm flying somewhere overnight and I'll just get right into the work the next day. This is an important book because it demonstrates perhaps the, the threat to our own health that we never really stop to focus on with every successive night of missed sleep each time that we lose a little bit of sleep. For me, the big takeaway from that book was in some places, like the UK, the clocks change. There are parts of the year when we gain an hour and other times when we lose an hour. And apparently they've done nationwide experiments in terms of how behavior changes when people lose out just on that one hour of extra sleep. And it is amazing how impactful and how important sleep really is. The one complaint that people have in reading that book is they, they never really finish it because they, if they're reading before bedtime, it kind of tells them in very clear terms that go they to need bed. to sit <laughs> down and get to bed. So that's the only two that really stand out. And in terms of fiction, it's, it's much wider. But I think the encouraging thing is just in terms of the accessibility of the fiction that is now available to a global audience. We've always known, I suspect, in Africa that we have some of the best writing mm. talent, that, mm. you know, there is a depth of talent in country after country. And the good news is that we're starting to see more of this in a lot more markets where there's finally a recognition of what African literature has to offer. There's finally a greater readership. It's been a gradual process. It started perhaps too slowly. Some writers are much more well known. And the hope is that on the back of this, we will see many more African writers being published more widely as well. And that will just lead to a better quality of what is available in terms of exchanging ideas and exchanging experiences and a better understanding of the worlds that we live in. Fantastic. Razia, you and I know very well that Africa is not a country. Uh, and what you and I have done right now as uh, uh, natives of the continent is uh, scratch the surface. But I suppose we, uh, the conversation will start a number of conversations around the issues that we've raised. So Razia, I want to thank you so much. I know you're very busy for creating the time to join us on In Conversation with Trevor. Allow me, Razia, remain where you are to ad address our, our global audience uh, in Africa uh, or uh, uh, in Zimbabwe and all over the world who follow this show uh, weekly to, to remind you that uh, you can press uh, subscribe here. And if you do, you get an alert every time we have one of these quality conversations. So until next time, cheers to you all. <laughs>